In today's Baldur's Gate 3 video, we'll take a look at some of the biggest mistakes I wish I knew about sooner. If you're struggling with hitting enemies and missing a lot, if you find yourself you're a bit too squishy or just generally not know what to do next, then hopefully this video will answer that and more. Now, one of the biggest things most people struggle with is missing their attacks, and that is because you don't have advantage against your targets. Having advantage against enemies is this game's way of increasing your hit chance by essentially rolling two dice instead of one and taking the higher number. Think of it as rolling with a dice and having to take a number over 10 for example, which would ensure your chance to win. If you roll just one dice, you only have one chance, but if you have two dice rolling at the same time and you take the higher number, obviously your chances are now doubled. This is essentially it when you have advantage. Now, there are various ways to gain advantage in combat, some of which are more complex than others, but the most straightforward and easy are by simply attacking enemies from high ground and also attacking enemies that have not seen you just yet. However, a ton of spells and conditions can further force advantage or disadvantage rolls on you or your enemy's attacks, which is usually either directly told in the description of that attack or implied by it. Bless is an excellent option early, it doesn't say advantage, but it does add an extra dice roll of 1d4 to both attacks and saving throws, which usually translates to a 10% increase in hit chance. Otherwise, Vow-like and Mithid-like spells from the Vengeance Paladin straight up give you advantage without any conditional effect. Old Person is another great one, it doesn't say advantage, but it's implied by its effect, plus it also guarantees critical hits. And we even have spells that incorporate advantage, such as Guiding Bolt, but you do have to hit your target first before that effect applies. There are even spells that have a 100% guaranteed chance to hit no matter what, such as Magic Missile from the Wizard, but AoE ground effects usually also have a higher chance to hit targets as they do linger for a bit. So Cloud of Daggers, Arms of Hadar, even like a Fireball, do have a pretty good chance to still hit targets. But you also don't want to be at a state of disadvantage yourself, since that ends up doing the opposite of gaining the advantage, which is reducing your chance to hit your targets. A common source of that is the threatened debuff, which is why you're always going to want to keep your ranged attackers from a distance and also have the high ground on top so that you gain that advantage and also have higher chance to hit them without being at a state of disadvantage. Obviously, there are plenty more in there that you can simply examine to see the effect that they give. The only other major one that I would say is also common is to make sure that you don't have your vision obscured, you're not being blinded, and generally can see through darkness. This is where something like dark vision, the passive that a lot of the races get at the start is very important. Otherwise, if you go with one that doesn't have it, use a source of light to brighten up the area and as such, see your targets better. The next step, even more important to avoid squishiness and to make enemies miss you more, is to focus on armor class, which please don't confuse with having to equip the beefiest plate armor because that's not how it works and many times it can be detrimental if you don't have the right proficiencies. So AC or armor class is just there to calculate how likely you are to get hit or get missed based on a dice roll. So the higher the AC a target has, the higher the attack roll an enemy has to make in order to hit them, otherwise it's going to be a miss. Say I have 19 AC on my main character, the enemy has to actually roll the dice on an attack to be 19 or higher to even hit me. You can of course even reach high levels of AC without ever needing any armor for that matter as this is a function of class and proficiency. So let's go over how AC is being calculated. All characters get a baseline of 10 AC when not using any armor, on top of which we will then add your dexterity modifier. Every 2 points of dexterity over level 10 provides 1 point of AC, so if we have 14 dexterity with no armor on, that would mean 10 plus 2 or 12 total AC. For light armor, it's the same dexterity modifier, However, you don't get the 10 base AC, but instead, we will calculate it by the AC provided by the armor. Otherwise, the calculation is exactly the same. Medium armor, however, which naturally has higher levels of AC, like 15 or 16, this takes into account your dex modifier, but it will cap it at plus 2, or the equivalent of having 
14 points into dexterity. And of course, we also finally have heavy armor, which already comes with the highest values, but will not gain absolutely any benefit from any dexterity scaling. Obviously, you will need to have proficiencies with these armors that you equip, otherwise you're just gaining huge penalties like constant disadvantage or not being able to cast spells. However, shields do not count as any type of armor and can provide a free source of plus two. So let's say, for example, you have a class or a character that only has proficiency with up to light armor. You can still put a shield on if you have shield proficiencies and gain that plus two on top. Anyway, now that you can defend yourself and even attack enemies, it's time to make things a lot easier out in the world. And number three, use the knock spell to open up locked chests and doors if you got sick of the lockpick roll every single time you have to do it, which is very, very often. Knock is a transmutation spell that you get as a bard, sorcerer, wizard, or even from various mage scrolls, and it just lets you unlock any object that is held shut by a mundane lock without having to have any lockpicks. This means about 90% of the treasures and doors that you find out in the wild, you don't have to play that mini game and waste time, just do a fast knock, open it and move ahead. By the way, another quick tip, if you find a chest that you somehow cannot open now because you don't have the tools, you can simply put that in your inventory or send it over to your stash and have it open later on at your camp. It will make you a bit more heavy, so be careful to not get over encumbered, but it's a better way than leaving a potential great treasure behind just because you don't have the tools at hand. At number 4, the usefulness of the non-lethal combat mode cannot be overstated as it can present a number of very strong advantages, especially if you want to get some extra free items from pretty much any vendor. So you can toggle this from the passive tab on your skill bar and this is going to instead cause your melee hits to only knock your enemies unconscious without killing them. So it won't work on ranged attacks nor spells if you read the remaining tooltip, but it does on the melee hits. This can be extremely helpful if you're playing on a non-lethal playthrough or even more if you want to get the extra loot without paying. So for example, if you kill a vendor, you can no longer take most of its stash, only like a couple of items, plus you completely lose access to it and will no longer be able to sell it anything from this point on. However, if you knock it unconscious, you can have access to a lot more items, usually one of each of anything above uncommon quality that it used to sell, and you can just grab that for absolutely free. Even the items that you previously sold to this vendor, you can just retrieve them all without any penalty. However, there is going to be one disadvantage, which is the fact that they will be pissed at you once they come back, because if you take a long rest, they will just recover but will remember you. However, just giving them a bunch of useless items eventually will make them forgive you. Another tip is you can use Stealth to Steal instead, which can be a little bit better depending if you have a character with lots of points in Stealth proficiency and Stealth checks, or maybe even getting a Blessing of Trickster on top to ensure you have or pass the Stealth checks. So you can use this plus invisibility to sneak behind any vendor and then just pickpocket them right away. This will not immediately make them hostile if you succeed, but this will let you grab one item at a time if you really want one without paying. There is going to be a roll for it and you have to roll the dice higher than whatever that roll is. So the higher quality or more expensive that item is, the higher the roll is going to have to be. And you will see by the line if your chance is high or small. So the more that circle is being completed around the dice, the more chance you have to succeed. Otherwise, if it's in the red, you're going to have a pretty tough time to get it. At number 5, we have Inspiration Points, which is how you get to reroll dialogues in case your dice roll fail, but it also provides a lot of extra XP, which is why you might notice some of your teammates leveling at different paces compared to others. And you get these by completing the background goals you find in the Inspiration menu. Every single background, as in the ones that you choose at the character creation screen, be it your own or your party members, has its own set of inspirational events. These can range from simple combat actions like resurrecting somebody or defeating a number of enemies in a single turn, to random things out in the environment, all the way to important story moments and decisions that you take. Like for example, how you choose to deal with the Druid Grove or the Goblin Leader situation at the start. However, inspiration points cap out at a max of 4, and everything over 4 is going to be converted into extra experience, so there's no benefit into hoarding these, use them whenever you fail a dialogue check. 
By the way, for certain dialogues, you can also gain advantage from various abilities. So if you use Thaumaturgy and you go with the Intimidation option in that dialogue, you get two dice rolling at the same time instead of just one. So basically, that's how advantage works. At number six, don't make the same mistake and rush through the content, leaving zones too early and going to the next chapter too soon. Early access was a bit misleading as it kind of let us freely go between the Underdark and the main zone, but later on you can miss out on a ton of content and character resolutions if you rush through the zones, especially if you push through going to the main city way too early. Plus there are many plot points and even endings you can unlock if you just linger a bit longer, interact with the extra characters and help them out for their own quests. Even for the quest lines of your own companions, there's a lot that you can miss out. Now, many things can actually move along with the story and you can eventually like do things a bit more differently, but you don't want to like skip over them and miss a lot of the romance options or many of the other benefits that you get from interacting with them by just like going through the content a bit too early. So linger around, discover the entire area and then move ahead. That is my suggestion. At number 8, there are 12 additional extra characters that you can recruit in your party, completely avoiding any of the companions that you yourself recruit. So Shadowheart, Asterion, Gale, you can just put these aside and go with completely different ones. This is especially useful if you want to go with classes that normally the others don't have access to, like Monk or Sorcerer, or if you don't want them to multi-class, if you don't want to reset your existing companions, and want to keep them at their default state or you already have a strong build for them and just want something to mess around with on the side you can just choose these hirelings from withers and kind of have your own mercenary group around you to help you in combat withers seems to be also the one that voices all of these hirelings which i find to be very funny because withers is a funny character plus they only cost about 100 gold to get and i believe you can just get another one in case the previous one dies and finally, two quick tips that didn't actually deserve their own spot. One of them is to constantly use speak to the animals and speak to the undead. They are absolutely very useful role-playing mechanics to use. They also provide additional information about certain quests. Let's say you do a mission in which a certain character is dead. You can actually reanimate that corpse and ask him questions, which many times can help you to solve a problem that you have during that mission or maybe you go in a place there's a bunch of animals you can speak with them and they will tell you things that normally you would need to investigate or find out on your own they can help you a ton to point you in the right direction which is why i recommend always have him on the bar or at least some kind of druid or other class that does incorporate these from early on you can of course check my other video that I made on the perfect start in Baldur's Gate 3 if you want something a bit more hands on or otherwise check out my previous paladin guide that absolutely wrecks everything if you decide to play with that class. Thanks so much for watching and until next time.